All right, Talking Tax here at uh, 5 p.m. on a given hmm, Wednesday. I'm Jay Fidel, and uh, that's Roger Epstein. Do you ever see a tax attorney in the flesh? You know, how many of you out there have met a tax attorney? Raise your hands. Good work. Here's one, Roger Epstein. Hi, Roger. Hi, Jay. How nice to see you. It's always a pleasure to be with you. You know, one of the, you know we, we framed this uh, show as should the little people be paying the tax? And it actually tracks on a number of discussions you and I have had uh, since, uh, what, uh, early 2017 um, about the tax reform, and I put that in quotes, uh, under the Trump administration, because it never really was about relieving the little people. It was always about taxing them, relatively speaking, more than anyone else. Isn't that nice? And those are the guys in his base. Isn't that nice? But where are we now? We, you know, we have issues in front of Republican Party and Congress uh, around tax in order to pay for infrastructure and other government benefits uh, that are part of Joe Biden's um, you know, program going forward. Uh, and it raises similar questions. Who pays the freight? And what is going on, Roger? And is that, does it bode well or not? Well, uh, I think the bill that Biden has is designed uh, not to tax the lower, the lower people, the little people. Uh, if it gets passed, the, the, the bill is designed to uh, tax anybody over uh, $400,000, which is a pretty high level of uh, income in a year. And that's taxable income. So I think they're trying to do that. Uh, one of the things that you asked me to look at for this uh, conversation was a New York Times article that talked about uh, Republicans not only not wanting to raise taxes, but not wanting to give the IRS enough money to collect the $500 billion of, of tax gap, they call it, you know, which means uncollected taxes. And the vast majority of that is from wealthy people who can get good tax advice uh, and maybe go over the go over the side, go over the edge, or even just uh, not not being criminal, but but just uh, going a little farther uh, than than the line. I, I used to think of Richard Nixon that way. His his uh, plan for the law was. You go right to the borderline of, of what's right or wrong under some provision, and then you just go a little farther into what's wrong. And uh, uh, that was kind of the, the idea of, of following the law. So I think we're at an unusual phase here where Republicans uh, not only uh, uh, don't want rich people to pay taxes, they don't even want to collect what the rich people owe. And uh, it's, it's really a function of uh, what I used to say, in China, the government controls the business, and in the United States, the business controls the government. And it, it really, uh, I don't want to get too deep into it, but it gets back to the fact that, uh, what was that scandal years ago, the, the savings and loan scandal, where Keating said, did you give all that money to those congressmen so they would do what you wanted? Then of course, that's why I gave them the money. What the hell do you think I gave it to them for? <laughs> so it kind of gets to that. But we're in such an incredibly incomprehensible, is the only word I can think about, where the vast majority of Republicans are little people who are not so wealthy, uh, and of course, the driving force remains the uh, one percent or how whatever percent who really don't want to pay taxes, no matter how much money they make. And nobody really wants to pay taxes. But the question is, how do you run the government? And so there, we've we've gotten ourselves into this this place where incredibly rich manipulate not only the Congress people, uh, but the, their own constituents. And so. Uh, how we get out of it, I'm not sure. As I've told you many times, when I first started with the IRS in 1967, the top tax rate had just come down from 90% to 70%. So not that everybody was paying that rate, but they were paying it on income over a million dollars a year, 
in today's dollars. And so now over a million, you're paying 35, 37 and a half percent. And they're all pissed, you know, why do I have to pay so much taxes? So we almost get into a question. It's hard to do this in my mind without the philosophy behind it. What's the purpose of government? Are we supposed to have a society where we keep people falling from falling through the cracks and, and, uh, or is government so odious, as it seems the Republicans think, that we shouldn't give it any money? You know, let's not feed the beast. Wasn't that the plan some years back? If we don't raise enough money, we can't have all this welfare. We can't have all these provisions because there ain't enough money for it. So somehow that got uh, sidetracked to, well, let's not collect any money or, uh, you know, taxation is a punishment as opposed to a civic duty. Yeah, well, I think, yeah, there's a couple of points you, you raise that are worthy of uh, unpacking. And, you know, one is uh, just in order of the way you raise them. One is, um, you know, what happens um, if people don't want to pay taxes, if, if Congress doesn't want to, um, if people don't want to pay taxes and Congress doesn't want to collect taxes, um, that's pretty serious because the government has no money People don't pay. The government cannot function. And then you get, you know, effectively, it, you know what it is? It's kind of this thing about, about anti-government. It's, um, yeah. it's a kind of a revolution against government. Let's take government apart. Uh, it's just another angle. It's not dissimilar from the insurrection of January 6th. Uh, we stop government from functioning by the power of the purse. If they have no money, there won't be a government. And that's what we want. This is ill-advised, of course, but it's, it really comes from the same place. And I agree with you. The second point is I agree with you that there's, a, there's an ideology involved, and that is we don't want to be our brother's keeper. If somebody down the road is starving, that's his problem. And if, and if, yeah. and if, if he could make a buck and be rich, good for him. If he can't, Bad for him, but it's not our problem. And this, this is, I think, Trump's view of it. And uh, this has been a Republican mantra for a long time, actually. It didn't begin right, right away. Uh, in fact, it goes way back into the 19th century, um, where, you know, it's not my problem. Let, 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 if he wants to be rich, let him be rich. It sounds like Marie Antoinette, you know, let them eat cake. Mm. Uh, and, and the problem about eating cake is that after a while, it's not sustainable, and they rise up with pitchforks. Uh, so yes. where, where does it all go, Roger? If, if you don't tax and you don't collect tax and you don't take care of the people who do pay the tax, what happens? Well, you have the kind of society that, you, you, you know, the Republicans want. Trickle-down economics, which has trickled down so slowly that 75% of the people in Hawaii are living paycheck to paycheck. And it's not much better or throughout the country, even though I don't have statistics, there's so many people working two jobs. And so this is actually good for business when you think about it, Jay, because if you're hungry, you'll do anything to work. And so if you want laborers, if you want uh, shopkeepers uh, or clerks in your stores, if you want people uh, to be answering phone calls, if you want to do a lot of kinds of work that don't require sophisticated knowledge or expertise, then you'd like having everybody starving, basically, because they'll take whatever they can get and they'll work two jobs and they have no options. So, so it, it, uh, it, it exacerbates the disparity then. The wealth Absolutely. Gap. Absolutely. Look, uh, when you and I graduated from college, uh, where I paid two hundred dollars a year and the same school now is twelve thousand a year, the same state college, uh, I was making ten thousand dollars a year and I could buy a house for fifteen thousand dollars. One and a half times my annual pay. If I make thirty five thousand coming out of college. What can I buy for fifty thousand? One and a half times my annual salary. What can I buy for three hundred thousand? The price of houses here now is almost a million dollars. 
And um, even in the cheap places around the country, it's two or three hundred thousand, which means if you're making twenty, twenty five thousand dollars a year, uh, you it's ten times or more what what you're making annually. So, yes, the wealth gap has has the great uh, uh, not wanting to sound like a communist, which I certainly uh, hate uh, the concept of top down communism. But uh, uh, the relative value of labor and capital is out of sync. It's gotten deliberately skewed. I mentioned to you when we started the talk about Lewis Powell's memorandum, uh, the former uh, uh, lawyer for the tobacco industry, come Supreme Court justice under Reagan, who wrote a memo in 71 saying the 60s is insane, these liberals are taking us to communism. We've got to we've got to fight back, and they took it where he planned. They took it to their own colleges, so we didn't have just liberal professors. Uh, they got all the judges enacted. They got all the local politicians enacted, and in '64 they took advantage of the quote Southern strategy, as you know, uh, the, the the Solid South was all Democratic from the time that uh, the first Republican president, Abraham Lincoln, freed the slaves until 1965 when the civil rights laws were passed and the solid South became solid Republican, just like that overnight. And even though uh, Lyndon Johnson said we lost the South for, an, uh, for a generation, he was wrong. We lost the South forever, at least the last 60 years, 55 years. So uh, we have a situation where the very wealthy understand that they're in the minority. They want what they want, but they're in the minority. And the way to get there, they have to manipulate some people. And the way they did it was through the race card. And uh, uh, it's been very effective. And they, they admitted it. They admitted it in the 70s and the 80s. You, you, you just have to uh, follow the path and look at some YouTubes and other kinds of material that's right out there. This is it's not a conspiracy. It's they're they're American citizens. They can do what they want, but this was their strategy. The strategy worked, and we've ended up with this wealth gap that's incomprehensible. And I'm not really a dead way to find out that it's an intentional wealth gap. Uh, it, it's intention it's an intentional effort to put some people down uh, and put them in this kind of servitude, you know, I use that term. Uh, experience where they, they're in a rat race. Um, I'm reminded of a book um, written by a New York Times reporter. It was called Dollars, uh, Penny, Dollars and Cents, I think it was. Um, and she, she went into the South. She divested herself from all assets. She had nothing in her pocket. Uh, and she tried to live the life of somebody who was in, you know, in the put-down class in the South. And she got a job at Kmart or Walmart or something like that. Um, no insurance, all part time, um, and, and they paid her minimum, minimum, uh, and uh, it was um, it was impossible. She couldn't, and she looked around her and found that the whole community was like that. They're all living hand to mouth. They had no savings, no prospects, no education, no nothing, uh, and it was remarkable that, that um, uh, she found herself in a in a situation where everyone around her um, was you know under the thumb. And this this is now almost 20 years ago she wrote that book. Uh, Ro yeah. Rosen, Rosenzweig, I think was her name. Bottom line is, um, you know, it was intentional. Uh, they were able to do it through a, a number of devices. Um, you can find, I, I agree with you, you can find writings. You can find professors in some of the Southern schools that actually taught this as a matter of economics. So here we have it. Yeah. And it's being extended now. Uh, it, it hasn't stopped. It hasn't come to rest. It's getting worse. Am I right? It is. It is. And and I think we're we're in a civil war. We're in a battle. And everything going on now is economics anyway. All the international stuff. It hasn't been. They talk about you know enemies and things, but it's really about economics. Uh, nobody realistically thinks we're going to drop a nuclear bomb on China or they're going to drop one on us. And it's a whole different world. But we're fighting desperately. For economics, which really, who are who are our warriors? You know, is is 
everybody's a global manufacturer. Everybody's a global salesperson. So it's a it's it's wrong, and and it doesn't make sense, Jay. It doesn't make sense for the uh, the reasons you've said. And can we change it? You know, my experience has been when things don't make sense, they eventually collapse. But we've weighted it so heavily ever since Reagan. Reagan really. So you take this Lewis Powell memo and, oh, I'm sorry, I got to think of the name. There's a book that just came out this year that talks completely about this, explains the whole thing. It's very, very powerful uh, and very clear. And so the idea is the elite, the economic elite deserve what they have. They've worked harder. They've got it. And if they do well, a rising tide lifts all ships. But the problem is they've held on so tightly to the profits competing uh, internationally. The one big jump on this was when the Arabs took over the oil in 74, you had these, these very wealthy Arab people who were nowhere near as sophisticated and capable as the Sions of business in the United States, who've been running the world economically for 20 to 30 years since the war. Uh, all of a sudden, these guys were making more money than them. So they had to ratchet up the, you know, the senior salaries. And so the guy on the shop floor was making, you know, 30 or 40 times uh, less. The, 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 the CEO was making 30 or 40 times what the guy on the shop floor is making. Now the guy on the CEO is making 400 times what the guy on the shop floor is making because they had to play up to that level. And then you had the Japanese take over of industry and, and cars and stereos and all this in the late 70s and 80s. And so they had to keep up with that. And so, you know, it's like uh, uh, you're at the top of the, the list and you're still looking up. You're not looking down to see how they're doing. You're looking up to see how you and your contemporaries are doing. And uh, it's, it's, it, it has to uh, stop or we're gonna go into third world stuff. How much worse could it be than she explained in her book, and now it's 20 years later, how much worse do you think it is, Jay? Oh, I, I think it's a lot worse. And it's getting, it, 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 it accelerated during the Trump time. By the way, the name of the book is Nickeled and Dimed. Nickeled and Dimed, Nickled if anybody wants to look at that. Um, and it's, a, it's the same story we're talking about, how you know there are oppressed people all around this country. And it, what's really ironic is that they're in the red states. These oppressed people who don't know which way is up uh, are suffering yep. more. Um, and, and so, uh, it, you know, it's hard to accept this. But one, one thing- um, Well, let me tell you, I, I, I thought the name of the book. The name of the book is called Evil Geniuses. Uh-huh, oh, good. It's written by, it's written by a, uh, uh, a, not, uh, a journalist evil geniuses and uh, outlines all this and yeah well how are we going to change well and not not to like... say that this is a solution but back again in the yeah. 19th century there was this french concept there was a french term in europe and it's if you were very wealthy you felt that you had to help people the people who you were uh, exploiting you had to help them and no you gave them money oblige. No, no bliss oblige. Bliss thank you oblige. Trying to think of that term. That's exactly right. That's going to be in the final exam, Roger. Noblesse oblige. Thank you. I hope I and, pass. <clears throat> so you got very wealthy, and 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 then you. you it was kind of euphemistic because you know that uh, these guys, Vanderbilt and Rockefeller and uh, uh, Andrew Carnegie, they, they weren't uh, giving a whole lot of money away. And when they died, maybe they left it for tax purposes to a foundation. But during their lives, they didn't give a whole lot of money. But the notion that they were selling was, we're helping you. We know we've exploited you. You're going to get some money from us. And today, as you say, the disparity between the guy in the factory floor, you know, and Bill Gates or uh, Jeff Bezos, who spends his money going into space, I find that very ironic. Um, you know, th those those guys have so much money. Even if they gave billions away for charity, it would be nothing compared to the the, well, the size of their estates. So what, what you have is, um, is, is, a, is a complete lack of noblesse oblige. It's noblesse oblige in reverse. As we said, yep. I'm keeping mine and you can struggle. And if you can't be a, a, right. a billionaire and, and like me, that, it's your problem. And we call that uh, a freedom. We call <laughs> that uh, freedom. Everybody has the freedom to do what they want, they want, except 
we have all the money and we control all the rules and uh, uh but every but it's all freedom and uh, uh you know uh, look back to franklin roosevelt in the in the uh at the end of the depression or in the middle uh, and he was considered a traitor to his class but his belief in part was if they didn't do something forget no bless no please if they didn't do something they're going to have a revolution because everybody was living in the streets and it was you know much worse than it is today but we could get there jay yes there, I every agree. time you turn around, more people sleeping in the streets and 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 why do we need to do that why why is that okay is that the american way of life do when you say government of the people by the people for the people does that mean everybody for himself uh, uh, I I just don't okay I I got to get into this philosophical because I'm I'm reading a wonderful book from my dear friend Elizabeth Satoris who's an 85 year old evolution uh, biologist who wrote a book called Earth Dance which says the Earth is really alive and and everything started with the fire of the Earth and then the atmosphere cooled it off and then we had a crust and the crust made rocks and the rocks made minerals and the minerals made one cell of animals. And she shows a pattern of how everything goes through uh, uh, unity to chaos, chaos to competition, competition to collaboration, and back to unity. And then eventually something throws it back into chaos. But we're in this period now of heavy competition between humans. And the next phase whether we get there because we have a revolution or it gets so bad that even if people in the South wake up, that they're being hoodwinked, we've got to change to a recognition that we're all really connected to each other in many meaningful ways, not just noblesse oblige, but through quantum physics, we know we're energetically connected to each other. And so if I hurt you, it hurts me. And that, that's the reality that we now know since Einstein and with Elizabeth's idea, these patterns of how everything evolved in nature, we've just been too competitive, too many thousands of years of murders and wars and killing people and holding down the feminine principles. It seems to me that it's all coming together for a good change. And what well, that well, or a bad one, Roger. Just as easily, it could be well, a really it bad could go change. On, you know, the bad one, it, yes, it could go on, but. At some point, as she shows, chaos forces itself to come to. It gets so horrible. If Trump wasn't it, I don't know what was. But at some point, it gets so horrible that you have to react, and you ha you, you you're desperate to change things. Okay, but let me, let me say United that when you reach that point, you know the the state of the species, if you will. You, when you reach that point, and you recognize this is out of the stories of of Helm in the Bible, when you reach that point, it may be too late. You can't go back. Some things you can't fix. You know, you didn't realize it was going south. That's that's not exactly the best expression. You, you didn't realize it was going <laughs> south, but, but it we went realized. south. And by the time you realize it, you can't do anything. And then you're really in the soup. Um, and well, so uh, going back to your question, what what can we do economically? In, ter in terms of yeah. tax policy, in terms of what Joe Biden should be doing, or what this is a long one, and what Congress should be doing in order to uh, level the f the field again to get us back to balance. Yeah. Well, I think it's obvious uh, that uh, uh, as a tax lawyer, and no matter what the Republicans have said, lowering cutting the tax rate in half, from seventy percent to thirty five percent has had a huge impact on the ability of the government to take care of needs of people and the, and the pollution and, and all the things that are going on. We really have to uh, do something about that. And uh, it, it, you know, there's different ways to do it. You can ratchet it up gradually, or you can do something fairly draconian, put it back to even 50% as the top tax rate or 70%. And and Biden recognized that even people making a couple of hundred thousand dollars a year are not living high on the hog. That's why he put it at 400,000. 
but he only pushed the rate up to what 39 percent. So I, I, you know, it's got to go a lot higher than that in my mind. And the second thing, it's so number one, do you do it at a federal level, or what do we do in Hawaii? We have an opportunity in Hawaii, uh, like nobody else does in the country. We're we're uh, a very multicultural society with with uh, very very few relatively uh, incredibly wealthy working people. We got a lot of retirees, uh, and so we're we're uh, could be of a single mind to help everybody have food, clothing, and shelter. Um, and so the government knocked down the tax rate. Uh, why don't we kick ours up and take some more money? Why don't we uh, tax the hotels? Here, Here's a, uh, uh, I, I could make enough enemies for myself for the rest of my life, but really, uh, tourism, if you tax the hotel, this is something I've, I've, I've thought about for a long time. If you tax the hotels on their value, then what would, they would either raise rates, which, okay, if people out of state want to pay that or whatever, or they couldn't raise rates because they're already too high when they used to be quite reasonable, relatively. Uh, or uh, uh, you would have to take lower profits. Lower profits would reduce the value of the hotel because the value is a multiple of how much you make. And so the price of things would start coming down. And so is that fair when the price has gone up 10, 20 times more than the price of labor? And so I'm not, a, I mean, obviously, if you start your own business, if you put your capital into a business, you need to recover. You need to be treated fairly. But like the CEOs, do you make 40 times as much or do you make 400 times as much? And when you make 400 times as much, you really uh, throw everything off the wall. Uh, there's another interesting book. Have you ever heard of Donut Economics? No, oh, tell me. Donut Economics is a creation of, uh, I think it's about 15 years old now. They're trying it in Europe. Okay, so in the center of the donut, the donut hole is people who have fallen through the crack and don't have enough to live on in your society. The, the fleshy part of the donut is where you want everybody to be living. And obviously, the wealthier people are, are, are at the top of, you know, the outside part of the donut or the top of, you know, the outside. Outer edges of the top, and uh, less wealthy people are closer to the hole. But the outside of the donut is when you're screwing up the whole environment, and when you've made everything so bad that you you can't go on anymore. So that's the control. We don't want to ruin uh, the the planet. We don't want to ruin uh, all the systems, and we don't want to let people fall through the the hole in the donut. And so taxes is a major part of that, Jay. And uh, uh, it's, it's not, it has never been effective to set values on things, but it's always been acceptable. In fact, we passed an amendment to have an income tax in 1913, over 100 years ago. So there's nothing improper about it. And in my mind, there's nothing improper about uh, paying more if you've gotten more out of society because you've done better. And here's something that, that I, 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 I would love people to understand because so many people on both sides of the spectrum to say, we should have just a flat income tax rate. That is so preposterous and so anti-democratic because, okay, I'm making a million dollars a year and you're making 50,000, say 100,000 a year. And we each pay 15%, right? I pay 150000 and you pay 7500 if you're making 50000 I pay 20 times the taxes you have. But you know what? With my 42500 I can't even afford to rent a decent house. But you still got 850000 left, and you can't spend more than two or 300000 And so you've got discretionary income of another four or five hundred thousand dollars. Now, God bless you. I'm glad you did it. But on the other hand, we're in the same society. You've benefited enormously more than me, and you can't let all these people fall through the donut hole. Not if you want to have a society where people are living decently. And 
and it doesn't help anybody to be in a society. It doesn't make you happy to walk down the street and step over people asking you for money. It doesn't make you happy to see people living in horrible conditions. You may be able to put it out of your mind, but most of us can't. And the collective consciousness that Jung talked about uh, is real. We feel it. We're all feeling bad that so many of our fellow citizens are in such a sad state. Well, I mean, and there's and a real practical aspect to that, too. Remember Marie Antoinette, let them eat cake. She lost her head over that. <clears throat> and, she and, lost uh, her head. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I think the, that the, in, the, in the cards, if you have enough people who are beyond the tipping point, who have nothing to lose because they're so poor and miserable, they will rise up. And, and the, well, the rich guys the will East. be at the wrong end of that. Yeah, you see it in the middle. And that's what I was saying about Franklin Roosevelt. He understood that. And he said, we've got to give some back. We rich people have to give some back to society. Look, if you pollute all the rivers and you leave it on the community to fix it and then everybody gets sick, how, how can you say, well, uh, I made all this money. I, I shouldn't have to clean that up. I shouldn't have to pay taxes. Uh, there's so many things that have just gotten, not that they're wrong so much as they've just gotten skewed. They've gotten out of alignment. The, as I said, the, the relative value of what I can get for my labor doesn't allow me to buy any capital anymore because the prices are so high. And so the only way to get back is to raise the wages and lower the capital value. Well, and but you know, that's, that's I, I wanted to ask you that last question. It's political. Um, you know, yeah. how, how do you fix this? Uh, first of all, uh, the article I sent you about the $500 billion, that's low-hanging fruit. You know, you wouldn't yeah. have to give the Internal Revenue Service very much money. Then all of a sudden, that would start pouring into the till. Um, because A, because they would go hustle and get it. And B, is because people would see uh, they won't be able to get away with not paying it. Uh, and, and, and that's the key. Jay, that's the key to our system. You know, I worked for the IRS for five years. The key to the system is people believing they'll get caught if they do wrong. And everybody knows you won't because there's not enough uh, personnel around to catch anybody. They only audited 1% 50 years ago. I can't imagine what that number is now. It's probably a tenth of a percent. Yeah. And certainly the rich people understand that. And, and so you've got to go after them because... Uh, uh, they'll take a chance that they're just a little over the line, like I was talking about Nixon. Sure, and, 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 and get away that with it. Hundred billion dollars. But the other part of that, Roger, it's a and it's a another change in our society is that people are more inclined to try to get away with it. Your Richard Nixon example, they get to the line a little bit over the line. They play with the line, yeah. uh, and the problem is, you yeah. know, we shouldn't be we shouldn't be thinking of it that way. We're in this together. Um, we, we have to find the social compact again. Uh, we have to be happy to pay taxes in order to have a good country. Um, nobody wants that no, anymore. That, We've lost that. Wait a minute, doctor. Wait a minute, doctor. I, 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 I have fallen out of the belief that anybody is going to do anything really against their own interest. Uh, I read somewhere that people worry what people think about them after they have a little uh, uh, not a confrontation, just meeting. You know, you walk away, you think, oh, gee, that didn't go too well. Uh, the other person must think badly of me. And it says, no, 95% of the time we're thinking about ourselves. And so it really doesn't matter. He's going to lose whatever he thought of you very quickly. But <laughs> we have to, un I, I really believe, Jay, we have to understand not that we're good people. Jesus hasn't been able to convince anybody to do it that way for 2,000 years. <laughs> the way it's going to happen is through Einstein's exposure, Einstein's understanding that has to come into common knowledge, that we are all connected to each other, that anytime I do something bad to you, it karma is a real thing. Coming back, my bad deeds come back. If we, we're not going to get it until we see it in our own self-interest not to hurt you, our own self-interest not to throw you into the donut hole. Okay, that takes me to my last question because we're really out of time here. My last question yeah. is, um, okay, it would be nice if Congress would um, you know, appropriate some money to 
reinvigorate the Internal Revenue Service? That's a big question whether they'll ever do that. But the other is, you know, you and I were talking about, just as we were talking about the flip side of what Trump did in, in January of 2017, talking about tax reform, real tax reform. That's the key to all of this. If you shake and bake this whole discussion, the key to all of it is tax reform, fair-minded tax reform, reform we should have had years ago. But we have a Congress yeah. that's dysfunctional. We can't do this by proclamation. We can't do it by wishful thinking. Uh, even the Internal Revenue Service has to follow whatever the, the rules are. So query in this country, and we're running out of time, I think, how do we do that? How yep. do we get real tax reform through a statute? That's what we need. Yeah, I think uh, Biden's on the right track. You keep pushing. Uh, hopefully, even if it's a slim majority, that will continue on. And uh, when you have a majority, when you can get things passed in both houses, you do it. And whether they got to get rid of the filibuster or, or what they have to do, go through it. Uh, uh, if it takes a month, you know, we'll just filibuster every day. I don't know what you do. to, But I'm saying let's not assume everybody's going to change to the common sense we believe you and I are speaking. Let's let's work with our slim majority. Let's keep putting forward bills that make sense, that will undo the damage we've done to ourselves over the last 40 or 50 years. And little by little, maybe we'll come back to some balance and then people will begin to see the truth of what's going on. Is things are better with sensible rules and yeah. sensible laws that yeah. Yeah. people fairly. Well, I think, Roger, I think I hear your phone ringing and I think it's the White House calling. Um, I, why not? Oh, yeah. That's a line one. Mr. Trump? <laughs> Mr. No, no, Trump? No, wrong oh, no. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, oh no. I got it wrong. <laughs> Thank well, you, Roger. We have to continue this discussion. There's so it's much more to discuss. <laughs> yeah, I know, Jay. It's great to talk to you. And I still think we could do it in Hawaii. We don't, we don't have the legislature that we would like to have. Uh, people with open minds and clear thoughts, and, uh, but we could get there. We could do it in Hawaii. We could start in a lot of ways, and, and we could become <clears throat> the place to model for how to live uh, not only uh, uh, with aloha, but with a little money in our pockets, too. Wouldn't that be nice? Roger Epstein, yeah. uh, a fellow who's going to come back and drill down with me on so many issues that have been raised in this show. Uh, Roger Epstein, tax attorney, uh, par excellence. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jay. Aloha. Aloha.